a lot of people didn't know of her story at all. Mm. Um, the the response has been mixed, to tell you the truth, in the past seven years. Uh, a lot of it has been positive, and uh, unfortunately, some of it has been negative. Uh, people um, suggesting that that she possibly uh, deserved to to end up in a um, in a situation uh, like what what happened to her, which uh, I can't understand at all. Mm -hmm. You know, that doesn't make any sense to me at all. But you, you know, you can't you can't figure out how how people are going to react to to a story. It really does. I mean, I kind of. I love the I love online and obviously because you and I both try to do great things online and and, and indulge in the passions that we have. Yes. But I kind of miss the period of time before before there was an internet when when we didn't know there was such kind of animosity and and viciousness out there. Absolutely. <laughs> so, Absolutely. You know? Yeah, uh. it it never uh fails to surprise me um the degree of animus a lot of people show especially when they don't know who they're who they're speaking with or talking to uh yeah yeah they'll they'll just let the the vitriol you know fly yeah uh any any time they want and and it gets pretty it gets pretty sick actually it mm -hmm. really does i think i think it's the protection of anonymity that that really right. empowers these people they've been there all along but now they have a forum to kind of express it but um you know i i'll tell you that earlier this year i i don't live in la i live in florida but i but i try to get to la as much as possible i, I took a trip earlier this year there and we went on a on kind of, it sounds ghoulish but it was actually very entertaining and enlightening on on kind of like a a, a death tour yes i heard of that yeah, and it was completely fascinating. And I thought to myself, we need to do a series of shows on, on, on you know, the old Hollywood scandals and and try to demystify it and try to bring some new information to light for people too. And that's when I found the Forty Eight Hours episode on Krista Helm. I did not know anything about that story prior to that. And then, I, of course, I found your beautiful article on online that reinforced a lot of that. But. Um, so, I so think tell very me... little was written about her death at the time that it happened. Um, yeah. Why I don't do you think that think is? The newspapers reported it very heavily for whatever reason. I, I'm not sure why that is. Yeah, I'm not sure either because it because just from a, a, a just from a media standpoint, it's got all the elements of a, a juicy, you know, Hollywood s story really. Absolutely. Yeah. A lot of people have um called it a modern day black dahlia uh type story and uh, in a lot of ways it is yeah you know especially because of the brutality of um both of their deaths uh Krista's and Elizabeth Shorts yeah so tell me uh what you can about Elizabeth or not Elizabeth uh about Krista <laughs> You just said Elizabeth Short. Uh, about Krista prior to her arrival on the L.A. scene. T tell me what you know about her growing up and, f and family life and aspirations. Right. Well, she was raised in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, her father, Harry, was a um, – he worked in, for an asphalt company, and her mom, Dolores, was a housewife. And um, from what I've been told, uh, her mom was a, an alcoholic – and it caused a lot of problems in in her parents' marriage. And um, I think they split up about three years after Krista's uh, birth. Um, she she and her two sisters stayed with their mom for a few years, but because of her mom's lifestyle, um, they were exposed to uh, a lot of unsavory people. Uh, her mom had taken into had taken to seeing a lot of um, different men and I guess a lot of them were abusive and the girls were were more or less terrorized by these individuals and uh, they went to to live finally with uh, their their father who had remarried and um, Krista was said to be very fearless as a as a teenager uh, quite forward uh, strong uh, she didn't she she didn't suffer fools gladly, let's put it that way. And um a bit on the wild side. 
Yeah. And by age 16, she decided to elope with a um, an older guy, a 27-year-old man named Gary Clements, who was rumored to be involved in the mob in Milwaukee. And uh, their their wedding, their marriage was very brief, and um, I think he he disappeared shortly afterward. She didn't see him again, or didn't see him for several years. Um, anyway, she gave birth to a daughter, uh, Nicole, in August 1967. And in the late 60s, she decided to uh, move to New York City with her friend Diane Mitchell to pursue a career in modeling. And that's uh, that's really where her show business career started in, in New York. Mm. So she was, uh, do you think, because, uh, uh, I mean, a major part of her story that we're going to get to involves uh, her gaining a sense of self-empowerment and, and trying to get to the next level in her career, and yes. and men, her relationships with men was an essential component of achieving that for her. Right. Right. And, and, and looking at her background, I mean, I'm not to play closet psychologist, but I mean, it, it's, it seems like if, if what you're saying is accurate about the, the, the men that came in and out of her mother's life, it seems like maybe th- the idea was born then that she, she would use her own allure to, uh, to actually empower her, herself and get what she wanted out of life. Totally agree. I think there was an element of subconscious revenge at play uh, mm-hmm. later on. And um, because I was told by several people that uh, she enjoyed manipulating the men in her life, Uh, she actually kind of got off on it. So um, I'm sure that had its genesis in what she uh, was exposed to as a a young person. Yeah. How much luck did she have with with modeling once she she and her friend moved to New York? I'm not sure how much luck she had. I've never been able to actually find any um evidence of her of her modeling in terms of you know photos or magazine spreads or anything like that but at some point uh while she was living in Manhattan she met a wealthy producer named Stuart Duncan who um who became her her main benefactor so to speak and uh he more or less uh, promoted her career and tried to help her a lot, um, helping her make connections and things like that. Did was he involved in the uh, in the Broadway play that she ended up investing in? Or yes, he was the producer of uh, Godspell. And um, uh, our research, Steve's and my research, showed that she had invested some money into the production of God. But I'm not entirely sure if it was her money or Stuart Duncan's. Uh, but at any rate, she uh, supposedly made a profit um, from from the uh, success of the play. Yeah. And uh, at one point, he he set her up in a beautiful um, apartment on the east side, um, seven room duplex, and it was lavishly furnished. And um, she was she was doing quite well for herself, um, probably by 1970, 71. Hmm. Did that, and how did that? Well, first of all, tell me about her daughter during this part point because her daughter did not go on these journeys with her, did she? No, she didn't. Her daughter was left behind uh, with Krista's mother, Dolores, until it was um, decided that she would be better off in different surroundings because evidently Dolores's alcoholism had worsened by then. And so um, it was decided that uh, Nicole would be given uh, to a nanny to care for. And the nanny was a woman named Gertrude Baker, and she lived in Vermont. So that's where Nicole grew up, um, Mm. in a small town in Vermont. Do you think that, um, in, 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 in your feelings, how important was, was Krista's daughter in, in her life? I'm not really sure, in all honesty. Um, I would like to think that she she loved her deeply, and um, but Krista was very ambitious, and I think um, her ambition 
was probably her motivating force in those years. And um, I think her relationship with her daughter was definitely on the back burner for for a long time, for many years. Yeah. Um, so what led her to L.A.? For, did she go straight to L.A. from New York? Uh, yes. Uh, before she went to L.A., um, Stuart Duncan financed a film project to promote um, Krista, and it was it's called it was called Let's Go for Broke, and it was um, an adventure film, an adventure film um, produced in partially in Haiti, mm. and Krista had the lead role of an investigative journalist, and it was um, definitely a grade Z production, but uh, he financed the entire um, project. And um, I think there were a lot of problems tied to the project, and it took several years for it. That was in 1973. And I think by 75, she had moved to to Hollywood to pursue acting. Um, She wanted to to, to work in TV and in films Mm -hmm. out there. Well, that... uh... Were there mob were there mob connections in some way to Let's Go for Broke too? I'm not really sure about that. Steve Thompson may know about that uh, more than I do. Uh, that, okay. that doesn't ring a bell. To tell you the truth. I, I I think he mentioned something about that because what's odd is it seems like on the periphery uh, the mob was was p- p- presence was there through many events throughout her life. I believe uh, that too. Yeah. yeah, I think she um, had an an adventurous streak in her, and she she kind of liked hanging out with dangerous types. Yeah. And I could see where she would gravitate uh, towards mobsters and thugs and you know pe- low lives, people like that. Right. Well, Fringe she characters. you exactly yeah. But you, you you said that she she went for TV work when she was in LA, and she had some success with that because she was in stuff like Wonder Woman and uh, Starsky and Hutch, and so she yeah. there's footage of her. I mean, so she did have some success there. She had a small role in Wonder Woman, and basically just a bit part in Starsky and Hutch. And her daughter um, told me once that Krista also did a Copper Tone uh, TV commercial. And that she was auditioning for the Cheryl Ladd role uh, on Charlie's Angels at the time um, that she was murdered. She had uh, already auditioned for that part. Mm. So that 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 was kind of fascinating to me to hear. Now the you know the, a big part of the story too that that came out in the Forty Eight Hours episode that I saw was that she supposedly kept uh, a, a diary or recorded. Uh, encounters that she had with various uh, celebrities, I guess. Uh, is, is that uh, hearsay, or do we we know for a fact that those ex- those existed? Krista's roommate, Stephanie Warshaw, uh, her roommate in Hollywood, unequivocally denies um, the existence of any love diary or sex diary, whatever you want to call it. She said Krista did have an address book with many people's names in it, and um, there were many Hollywood um, stars' names in it, um, especially you know male male stars that she knew. But it wasn't a diary. However, um, she did record her uh, several um, instances, uh, several dates or uh, uh, liaison, liaisons with uh, different Hollywood um, actors, and and those tapes uh, did did in fact exist. Uh, they were later taken, though, after her death, and I'm not sure if, if any of them have resurfaced in, in you know the past 30 years. Did she, did she ever express to her roommate or anyone else her motivations for recording those encounters? No. Um, Stephanie doesn't feel that Krista was uh, about extorting money from anyone. Uh, she didn't think that was her style. Uh, she she highly doubted she highly doubts that allegation and she doesn't think Krista would have ever done that. Um, it could have just been a, a, a kinky habit, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Um, but a, as for the diary, um, Stephanie insists that there was no diary, and, and yet 
that that seems to um, be mentioned um, quite quite a lot uh, whenever whenever Krista's um, story is mentioned. The diary is right there, you know, right there in the description of of her death. Yeah, because it's uh I mean that's the, that's the major element of uh old-time Hollywood scandal right there. I mean the, yeah. uh, for lack for lack of a better word that's that's the kind of the romant romanticism romanticism of the whole thing Absolutely. for a lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. I mean, I I guess in a way it it makes her story uh more enticing for a certain element of of people, you know. It's yeah. Kind of like the, the thought of this of this diary floating around that could implicate, you know, any number of people in, in what happened to her. So did the, did the, if it wasn't a diary and it was, but she did keep some kind of black book of contacts and that kind of stuff yes, that, yes. that went missing or that disappeared? Yes, that, um, actually Lenny Barron, who was a clothing designer, confidant slash friend of Krista's, uh, came to her apartment after Krista's murder and um and absconded with the address book um some of the tapes and um Krista's uh wardrobe uh her furs and her clothing um it wasn't Lenny Sir- I don't know how you say his name uh Lenny Sirico from the Tony Sopranos. Tony Sirico yeah 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 Tony Sirico it wasn't Tony Sirico who came to the apartment. It was Lenny Barron, according to Stephanie Warshaw, and and he left with Krista's belongings, and evidently brought them back to his home with him. So okay, so so to, Tony didn't go to the apartment, according to the roommate, but but Tony was still part of the story, if only because he was seeing Krista's sister. Is that what was happening? Yes, uh, he dated or saw her sister Marisa, Marisa uh, Rahm. I think she also went by the name of Marisa Helm, and uh, he was dating her at at some point. So he and Krista evidently knew each other, but I don't know how well. So why did he get dragged dragged into this as such a big part of the story? Tony? Yeah. I'm not sure. I'm really not sure because... um, (laughs) I, I'm in close contact with Stephanie Warshaw, and, and she insists that it was Lenny Barron who came to the apartment to get Krista's things, and Tony was nowhere to be seen. He had no part in that. And she gave and she gave him that stuff willingly. He didn't. He didn't yeah, take she, it. Yeah, she yeah. was more or less blindsided by it because she said he was um, in such a panic, and because of what had happened, she wasn't in her right mind, so to speak. She yeah. was very upset. So she allowed him to take whatever um, he came to take. And um, I guess for many years he held on to these things, but then, you know, uh, he, he passed away, I, I think, about 15 years ago. So I'm not sure what ever happened to uh, to Krista's possessions that he had. Well, I think the police have some some of the audio uh, sure tapes you're right. you, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so tell me an, another part of this puzzle, which which occurred, you know, just prior to her death, was she wanted to try to cut a music album. Yeah. Um, so, what record. were the, yeah, what were the relationships that she kind of molded from from that experience? Who who were those characters? Well, she hooked up with a radio personality. I think he was an East Coast disc jockey named Frankie Crocker. And he was evidently well known at the time, and um, he was hired to produce the session. And um, uh, Krista was involved along with uh, backup two backup singers named Debbie Danilo and Patty Collins, and um, a keyboard player named Blair Aronson was also on the session. But evidently, it was a very contentious um, project. And uh, I don't know whether there was professional jealousy involved or um, personalities that didn't mesh. And uh, there were a lot of problems during the um, production, I guess, of this record. And also at the time, um, there were there was rumored to be a um, an, a love affair between. 
Krista and Patty Collins, the backup singer. And Patty was said to be very jealous of Krista and very territorial of her. And I guess she she alienated a lot of people um, on the project. And um, and there there were there were just a lot of problems. It, it was a, a project that was fraught with problems. Mm. So what's interesting to me, I mean, we're we're, we're about to get to the actual crime itself, but um, if 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 what I've read. Uh, there, there, there was. I mean, there was no DNA at the time. That that technology had not come around yet. Yeah. But the right. the one piece of uh, the one uh, piece of blood evidence that they did find was underneath Krista's. Was it underneath her nails? Where was it on her? Yes, underneath her finger. One of her fingernails. There was um, female DNA found. Mm. Which which uh, that that was like a smoking gun gun type aspect, you know, to. It was a, quite a revelation, I guess, when when they discovered that. I would imagine so, because if it's underneath her feet, uh, her fingernails, then that that spells out a defensive, uh, you know, a defensive def- mm. evidence that she was trying to defend herself. Absolutely right, right. Mm. And um, some think that Patty Collins was involved because uh, evidently. I guess she and Krista had some personal issues, some problems, and um, Krista had told her to get lost. She was angry. She was jealous. And um, then there's the other camp that thinks uh, the other backup singer, Debbie Danilo, might have somehow been involved, but um, she denies it, you know, vehemently. So it's it's a real puzzle. Do you know if any, either of their DNA matched? I I do know that uh, Debbie Danilo's DNA did not match. They've been unable to, the detectives that were on the case um, six or seven years ago, uh, Detective Brandenburg, Detectives Brandenburg and Harris, uh, were unable to find Patty Collins at the time. And I don't know, you know, since that time if they've they've located her. But they were interested in... in, um, they were interested in getting an, a sample of her DNA as well. What's also interesting to me, speaking about the night that she was murdered, is that it came, it came out that the original detective always held to the idea that it had something to do with Sal Minio, since he was, mur- he was murdered by stabbing in that same area one year to the day that Crystal was, one year before. That's right. That's do you right. put any do you put any credence uh, credit into that theory? No, I don't. Um mainly because of the degree of overkill in Krista's murder. Um mm-hmm. it was a rage killing and I'm not sure if Salminio's um murder was also a rage killing, but I I tend to believe that um Krista's killer was absolutely someone who knew her and that they they were someone who who were very they were very angry with her very angry and um, now I I kind of think it was a coincidence that um, both both uh, killings happened on the same day one year apart yeah so tell me about that night where 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 was she coming from and where was she going when this occurred. Well, according to Stephanie Warshaw, uh, Krista was had attended a party. Um, however, sh- Stephanie says Krista barely knew Sandy Smith, um, who's been um, who it, it's been said was was Krista's agent at the time. Stephanie said Sandy Smith was more more of a friend to her than to Krista, and yet it was outside Sandy Smith's home. Uh, where Krista was found, so I'm not entirely I'm not sure what to think of. Um, evidently, she had left one party and was en route to another or another get together, and that's when she was ambushed in the street on Lloyd Place in West Hollywood and um, attacked, attacked from behind, stabbed 22 times, and bludgeoned with a blunt object, and. Uh, mm. Apparently, her screams were heard by a neighbor who came out to uh, to the sidewalk and, and looked f- 
for the source of these screams, but he, he wasn't able to see anything. And it was later said that if he had actually walked out to the street, he probably probably would have seen um, the murder take place. Oh, my God. And his uh, name is John Grease. And he's an actor, isn't he? Or he he's uh, an actor and the, and the son of um, a former 1950s actress in Hollywood named Marla English, who has mm. a, a bit of a cult following. And yeah, he's her son. So all of these all of these wounds took place in, in the upper torso and and head. Yes, uh, the neck, the face, her face. Um, yeah, her upper torso. Um, yeah, it's very sad, very very sad. And you, and you know you you make a great point that obviously a murder of this kind isn't a simple mugging. Uh, so uh, they they it was personal. It was probably vengeful and and it's uh and it almost those kinds of wounds they almost wanted to de- de- defile her in, in yes a way. destroy her her looks don't you think yeah. so that, that i would that's, imagine that's the feeling i have yeah so when was did somebody call the who called the police when did the police arrive and what did they find well um i think it, it was uh, detective Ganzi who was the the um the detective who who was assigned to the case, and he came upon her body lying underneath uh, a car, and uh, of course she was already dead and um, covered in blood. And uh, yeah, he he said it was um, a scene that he he never forgot. And he was a veteran of the um, L.A. Sheriff's Department, I guess, and he said that was um, one scene that he never ever forgot throughout yeah. his career. So it must have been very gruesome. Didn't somebody um, happen upon her, though, before, and, and alerted the cops to it? And, uh, I don't remember who it was, but somebody found her, and they said that it almost sounded like she they heard her give her a last breath or something when they approached. Yes, I, I think you're right about that. I'm not entirely sure, but I think you are right. Um, I can't recall right now. How far did the, in, you know, it's with it's in cold case now, and you know they, I think they investigated if they receive a new tip, but uh, outside of that, it's 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 you know it's a thirty-seven year old murder. Um, how far did the investigation go, and who were the main suspects at that time? I think one of the people, one of the people they questioned was a drug dealer. Hollywood drug dealer at the time named Rudy Mazella, whom Krista knew um, because she had um, gotten into hanging out with um, a bad crowd, uh, fringe types and uh, out and out, you know, drug dealers and criminals in in Hollywood. And at at some point, he had even um, admitted to killing her. Um, he had made a statement to one of his friends or cronies that he was responsible for her death. However, um, the detectives who interviewed him at that time uh, were not convinced of the veracity of his claims. Um, and, in fact, he later recanted um, recanted his, um, you know, his admission. And but he he was one of the suspects at the time and um i guess other people who were in her circle um but then after a while i i heard that uh, the hillside strangler case took precedence and yeah. Krista's um Krista's murder was more or less put on the on the back burner the investigation into her murder was kind of put aside for whatever and it had to have been it had to have been challenging because she she was around so many people. She was in all of these different circles, some some of them very questionable circles. And so it, it must have felt like quite a labyrinth to sort through all of those acquaintances. Oh, absolutely. I mean, because she knew the upper echelon in, in Hollywood. You know, she, she knew Warren Beatty and Ryan O'Neill, Jack Nicholson. Um, I think she was friendly with Mick Jagger and people like that. And then on the flip side, she also knew a lot of dangerous characters who, um, you know, who lived in, in the shadows. 
And so it was a real dichotomy of uh, humanity. Yeah. Do we get a sense that she felt that she was in danger? Is there any evidence that she she felt something was bad was going to take place? Well, her lifelong friend, Darlene Thorson, um, claims that Krista had sent her a postcard a few days or weeks before um, her death in which she had told Darlene that she was um, in fear for her life and that she had gotten into some, she was in some trouble that she didn't know how to get out of. So uh, possibly Darlene would be able to tell you more about that. Um, mm. I remember her, her telling me about that, and it, you know, it's pretty upsetting that she had that sense that she was in danger. Yeah, yeah. You know what's striking to me about um, what you do when you're when you're investigating something like this and you're writing about it is. Uh, when you're when you're covering a life story and a story of a death, do you become invested in it? Do you do you start to feel like you have like you know this person and you have a responsibility to tell their story? They become a part of you in a sense. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I've had that experience more with other people I've written about. Uh, for instance, I, I wrote a book about a 1950s starlet named Barbara Payton who had a very tragic life, and I I was very emotionally invested. I had it to a degree with Krista as well, but um, actually I, I find it kind of um, coming back now. And now now that I'm speaking with you and uh, going over her notes and all the material that I've accrued, you know, over the last 10 years or so, um, I've I've kind of renewed my, my com- feelings of compassion for her. Yeah. And uh, I, I've... I kind of understand uh, what she was about, and I don't think she was a bad person. I think she was misguided. And uh, But from what I've heard and read, she was actually a very warm person, a very um, outgoing and friendly and sweet girl, and um, a bit mercenary, perhaps. But, I mean, um, she, she she didn't have, you know terrible qualities uh in, you know that where she would deserve an end like what you know what she suffered yeah yeah well no one, I, yeah no i know a lot i know that. no no one does but i i understand a lot of people were quite taken with her and thought that she was yes. a, a, very, a very sweet girl very um sweet. yep a bit ballsy you know a bit yes. ballsy a bit forward but actually uh, maybe she was an archetype because um, y- you see that all all the time these days. You know, no one thinks twice about it. But you know, maybe thirty, thirty-five years ago, uh, that was a, a bit rare. You know, a little, a little bit more unique. Well, and it's always been, yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. But it's always been a cutthroat uh, business uh, if you want to oh, break yeah. in entertainment, and so you have to be very assertive and you have to you use who, whoever you can uh to 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 kind of get get to get to the finish line in in a way but it's the uh, way of the world it's the way of the world out that's there that's true I guess. yeah yeah you know what also speaks to me about about it is that uh i mean years years and years ago when i was a teenager and i first became aware of the stories behind the kennedy assassination uh, yeah. I became I became obsessed with that, and after a while, I said, "You know, this is a rabbit hole. I've 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 got to back off." But but part of the appeal <laughs> part of the appeal of these kinds of stories is the the human need to know the unknowable. But you but there's an right. answer out there. It's right there, but we just don't know how to get it. You know. That's right. Yeah, it's frustrating, isn't it? Yes. So frustrating, <laughs> but it's compelling. It really mm-hmm. draws you in and hooks you, and um, it, it's intoxicating in a way. It's addictive, um, and pretty soon I mean, it's very easy to be consumed by that. Very yeah. easy to be consumed. And I, I've I've just been thinking a lot about her lately, and uh, I feel such empathy for her that I really haven't felt in. Ever since I worked on that article with Steve, you know, I, I feel it all over again. And well, I, I want of, justice 
to be served there, for her. There needs to be justice, and and there's a. I mean, there, I I completely understand the empathy that you feel when you write about these people, but it's it's very, it's very moving what writers like you do because it's kind of sacred territory because you're doing your part to bring them back to life, which means bring them back into the consciousness of, of people that might make a difference in the case. Thank you. But, you know, emotionally, it is tough at times. It it tends to take a lot out of a, a person. If you invest that much of yourself into the subject, it's um, very draining at times, very yeah. depleting, very enervating. It, it It really takes a lot out of you. Well, these are. I mean, next next season of this show. I, I mean, I'm, I was trying to save some big stories for further seasons of it. But you know, I'm looking at a lot of these names of people like uh, you know Marilyn Monroe and uh, Rebecca Schaefer and Dominic Dunn and Dorothy Stratton, yes. and and it's just horrifying that all of these beautiful young women were so kind of mistreated. In, in their lives within this Hollywood world, uh, and I guess it's indicative of what happens everywhere. The, but um, but do, do you find that? I mean, outside of her murder, do, do, did you get the sense that Krista Helm did not suffer fools? Like she that she was within herself somewhat em, empowered. I feel she was empowered, but I also think she was kind of without a rudder once she went to Hollywood. Uh, she kind of got in over her head, and I just think it was a different environment for her uh, that maybe she wasn't prepared for. And I, I yeah. just think that uh, she really didn't know how to navigate those waters. Um, I think she she may have thought it would have been as easy for her in Hollywood as it had been for her in New York City. But for whatever reason, I don't think that was the case. Mm -hmm. I think she struggled a lot more once she came to Los Angeles. Things didn't fall into place for her like she probably thought they would. If you had to guess, what what element do you think was responsible for her murder? I think her dalliance with, uh, with, a, with a dangerous crowd out there, the drug dealers, you know, the small-time hoods, mobsters, the dark people, the dark street people. Um, I'm kind of thinking that, that maybe she devoted a lot of her time and energy into um, becoming a part of that world for whatever reason. Uh, it was seductive to her. It, you know, it kind of seduced her. She liked hmm. living on the edge. But, you know, these yeah. were very bad people, you know, and... Uh, I think she was out of her league with them, mm. especially with someone like Rudy Mazzella, who was, um, from what I hear, a total scumbag. A scary guy, yeah. Scary guy, yeah. Weird, very strange man. How, how many of these people? I mean, and, and a lot of these people are are dead now. Her her friend, yeah. uh, her friend Lenny passed on, and and you know. Uh, so. Um, Stephanie says most of those people led such reckless lives. She said she she's almost uh, sure that most she's very certain that most of them are are dead. And she said it's just because she turned her life around years ago that she's still alive. Yeah. She said because she was on she was on a bad road as well in those years. Was Krista? I mean, we all are to a certain extent, but. Do you feel that she was a chameleon of sorts, that she meant that she was different things to different people? Yes, absolutely. I've long felt that about her. It's very interesting to me that you bring that up. I think she could adjust her personality to whomever she was with. And yeah. that was probably one of her uh, most charming qualities, but it was probably also mad maddening to people. Because maybe they never knew who they were getting at any given time. Mm. I think she was very adept at doing that. Yeah. I, I got two more questions about Krista, and they're they're pretty pedestrian questions. But uh, her that wasn't her birth name. How, how did she get Krista Helm? 
<laughs> well, <laughs> she told one of her friends um, that an astrologer advised her to change her name from Sandra Lynn Wolfield, her her birth name, to Krista Helm, because uh, that name would bring her great wealth and fame and success. So huh. how true that story is, I, I don't know, but that's what I was told. And she had you say that she had a sister that lived in L.A. Yeah, Marisa Rom. Uh, also, she was also known as Marisa Helm. And from what I've been told, she was a go-go dancer or a dancer in nightclubs and uh, a part-time actress and um, kind of a groupie. A group. She she had kind of a groupie kind of lifestyle in those years. And I, I I suppose she's still alive. She's still were they alive. close at all? Uh, no, no, they weren't close. Um, I think there was a lot of uh, jealousy, and um, there was jealousy there, and competitiveness. Mm-hmm. And I I think that kept them from being you know real tight as sisters. Do do you is, is there is there any major part that we're we're missing of of her story because you've you've put in so much work into this I mean both writing the article years ago and then going through this two week refresher course and I'm so grateful <laughs> to you for doing that uh, is, oh is, believe is, is me there... I wanted to make sure that I had something <laughs> to bring to the table because I know how serious you are about this and your intentions are are totally honorable and uh, I really applaud you for wanting to do this for her. Well, th- thank you so much. Thank you so much. But it, I, I don't want to. I don't want to miss anything that that you've uncovered that you want to discuss. Is there anything that anything that we're missing? The only thing I can think of is, so many times when working on her article, I wanted to jump into the story and try to save her. And I'm yeah. wondering if you understand. I'm wondering if you understand what I mean. Absolutely, because when I went, when I, I'll tell you that was the that was the primary feeling I had when I went on that tour that I told you about Mm -hmm. because especially in hindsight and you know every detail about the 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 event and and what time it happened I I, in my mind I was thinking if only I could go back in time and and warn her uh, before this happened you know as irrational as that sounds but no I I totally understand I wish there there were there was a time capsule that we could take that to try you know to time travel and, and just become an advocate for the for that person and say, look, you know, you don't know what's ahead, but you have to listen to me and you have to take a different route. You have to yeah. get away from this. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a real strong, strong uh, feeling. I, I she, had that a lot. Yeah. What, do, you, do you think that, I mean that she she was talking about she felt that she was in danger and she she might come home or she might leave LA but do you feel that she had the wherewithal under diff- different circumstances or the talent to actually achieve some level of success in the industry had she lived I'm not really sure because um the, the little I've seen of her acting uh performances I I don't think she was um all that talented, I, I guess she she could have gotten better with with more training, but I don't think she had um, too much raw talent, raw acting talent. So I I'm not sure what her future would have been like in that town. That that's very intriguing. It's a very intriguing thing to think about. I think so. my the impression that I get and I um, in my conversation with with Stephen, he kind of reinforced this is that. She wasn't so much concerned with being a serious actress. She she just wanted to go straight for the stardom. She wanted yes. to be a star. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I agree. Yep. You're you're yeah. you're both right. You're both right on that. I totally agree. So you need to tell me just a little bit because I mean I, I I'd be anxious to cover her in the next season. Uh, you know I won't I won't uh, spend a lot of time talking to you about it now. Maybe I'll bring you back on the next season to talk about Barbara Payton. Tell tell me about the gist of her story and what sucked you into that. Oh, that would be great, Jamie. Um, Barbara Payton was um, a, a 
young girl from Minnesota. She grew up in a small town, beautiful, blonde, stunning girl, uh, moved to Hollywood when she was 20. Um, within a year of her being in town, she got uh, the lead role in a James Cagney film uh, mm. called Kiss Tomorrow Goodbye. She was signed to Warner Brothers um, Studios, but she was extremely wild and reckless. This is uh, the 1950s. And um, very promiscuous. Hope wound up blackmailing him, trying to extort money from all these different men. And um, there was a huge scandal in 1951 in which she was the center of uh, two actors by the name of Francho Tone and Tom Neal engaged in a brutal fist fight over her affections. And Tone was sent to the hospital in a coma and he almost died. And it... Um, it, it killed her career overnight. She was making, earning $10,000 a week at Warner Brothers. And within a couple of years, she, she made her last film. And after that, oh, she was arrested numerous times, um, beaten up. Um, uh, she wound up uh, living on Skid Row in Hollywood. She became a prostitute. And she wound oh. up dying of heart and liver failure at 39 years old and they said at the time of her death she looked like she was in her 60s oh. and I've written a book about her life called Kiss Tomorrow Goodbye I I researched and, and wrote the book um, it took me 10 years to research and to write it and it's it's gotten some good reviews on Amazon if you ever have a chance to check check them out um, maybe well I'll buy I'll buy the book uh, the book oh, itself is on well, no, absolutely. I'll buy the book. Yes. Oh, thank you. That's very nice. If I had a, a spare book, I would send it to you. But all my comps are long gone. <laughs> no, no, no. But, I'll uh, be happy to buy it. Oh, I appreciate it. I really do. Um, it's a, a very haunting, very haunting story. Extremely uh, sad. It's probably the saddest story other than Sharon. I think Sharon Tate's is the saddest Hollywood story. Oh, uh, yeah. But Barbara's, and of course, Krista's is very sad, Elizabeth Short, you know, because of the way they were, they were, they died. But Barbara's um, decline was so protracted. It, it just, it went on and on and on for years. And her life just kept getting worse and worse with no let up. And she was, at the end of her life, she was obese and toothless. She had sores all over her face. and At 39. At and, and 39. Wow, wow. Yes. And it was just um, a tragedy because she really had potential. She was a good actress, and she could have been a big star. So, um, yeah, that that's my baby. That that was something I worked on for, for a long, long time. It sounds like, and, it sounds uh, like personality-wise that she was quite the unique woman for her time, though. Exactly. And a lot like Krista. You know, there were elements of Krista's personality that absolutely reminded me of Barbara. Mm. And though that living on the edge type type person, I, I find that fascinating, especially when they don't seem to be of the times in which they live. That's mm -hmm. really what nails it, nails it for me. Mm -hmm. I, I love the idea of people who don't live like the mass majority live, you know, right. in, in that in that same time period. And what and what role does that play in in their demise? The fact that exactly. they weren't the norm. Yeah, I think it I think it plays a huge role actually, a huge role. But um, my my story has been optioned. Uh, my Barbara Payton story has been optioned by two film producers in Los Angeles, and they're trying to develop it for a film project. Oh my goodness! So I'm really keeping my fingers crossed about that. But you know, I know. It, it, that could probably take several years. That's what people tell me. That That's a long process, but nutty. but you know, uh, you, you think about these stories. Uh, I mean, I was t I was talking about the Black Dahlia the other day with someone that that the uh, homicide investigator that actually thinks his father killed the Black Dahlia, and I was listening oh to his God. story. Yeah, it's a fascinating story. But I was listening to him, and I was saying, why why isn't this a movie? <laughs> because I they haven't it. made. They haven't made a good Black Dahlia movie yet, and a role like Barbara Payton, any actress alive would be salivating for a role like that. Well, because it would run the emotional gamut, 
you know, yeah. and, really, and, and the phys- and the physical changes that the actress would have to um, would have to display. You know, it, it's sort of like who was it, Robert De Niro, when he when he uh, was in Raging Bull, didn't he have to gain I don't know yeah. eighty pounds or something? Or um, it would be the same for whatever whatever actress um, was chosen to play Barbara. She would just have to go through a complete metamorphosis. And, wow. Oh, I'm hoping it'll happen because I really think it, it could be an Oscar uh, role, Oscar winning role for for the right actress if the script is is good, you know. Absolutely. I mean, that's the first thing that came to mind for me. And and there's so many, there's you know the biopic genre is littered with so many bland titles. I mean, they're, they're, the approach is usually yeah. very bland and stale. But a subject like Barbara Payton or The Black Doll, if it's done right, I mean, those are just, uh, that, that content is so uh, compelling. That now, what happened with The Black Dahlia film? I know it was a bomb, wasn't it? Wasn't there a Black Dahlia film several years ago, yes. five or six years ago? I'll tell you, what it was so... It was so disheartening to me because it was directed by Brian De Palma, and right, and I right. am I am an unabashed Brian De Palma geek. So <laughs> we we did, yeah. we, we, we did a tribute show to him years ago, and he heard it, and he was complimenting us on it. And I said, "Would you come on our show so we can interview you because you're one of our heroes?" And he said, "Sure." Yeah. So I have a real soft spot for him, but right. and and he was perfect for a Black Dahlia movie. The problem is. This wasn't a Black Dahlia movie. It was it was about the love lives of the cops investigating the Black Dahlia. It was complete misjudgment. Why did they do that? That's such a waste because, of, of potent subject matter. It was based on the James Elroy book, and, and James Elroy's book was comp- very fictionalized. It just used the Dahlia as like a, a setup to explore that world in, in Hollywood at that time. Uh, so yeah, you're right. It, just a complete wasted opportunity. So there's yet to be a great movie on that. Wasn't it filmed in Europe too? It was, but I'll tell you, that's the one great thing about the movie is it looks beautiful. Okay. It's beautifully oh, okay. shot. Yeah. It was supposedly uh, filmed on a huge soundstage somewhere in Belgium or I don't know where. In Berlin, because they got oh, okay. they got good good costs there. Yeah. But it's beautiful. It's beautiful to look at. It really is. But, I, I really believe that if Barbara's story is filmed properly, it could be another L.A. Confidential. I, I swear. Uh, I mean, yes. I know. I hope that doesn't sound like a delusion of grandeur, but I think if it's done properly, it could be just as strong and powerful as L.A. Confidential. Because, uh, oh my God, it, wait till you read what what her life was about. She was absolutely over the top, a total exhibitionist, totally off the wall. One scandal after another, and gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous, mm. and talented. Did, she really had acting ability, and yet she's forgotten. I mean, you've never you never heard of her. No, no. She, she's all but forgotten nowadays. Well, as soon as I, I'm telling you, as soon as I, I'll, I'll buy the book tonight, and as soon as I, uh, I can get my head above water, and I finish the series this this month because I'm having to read so many books to research the series. <laughs> I, I'm yeah, gonna I'm man. gonna I'm gonna tear into your book because I'm fascinated by her story and what you told me about. That's it. very kind of you. I appreciate that. That's very kind. Thank you. No problem at all. And if you if you, I'll make sure that you get a link to the show. And if I have any questions, I'll email you some uh, some oh, questions please that do. They pop up. Don't hesitate. Now, when will you be speaking um, with Darlene? Do you think that'll be coming up soon? Or? Darlene says that she's. Uh, I'm going to give her some options. She 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 wrote me back and she said I, I'd love I'd absolutely love to do it. How, can I, how can I get in touch with you? And so I'm going to give her some options for times that we can speak. And and oh, I'm sure it'll be in the next week. And then uh, Nicole, right. uh, I, I talked to her Monday night. She wants to talk. Oh great, great. Do you, I have I do have a question about contacts. Uh, and I ran into this with the Dahlia too, because these cold cases in LA, I have no idea h- how to get in touch with the LAPD cold, cold cases. Uh, I detective. think Steve Thompson's wife would know how to do that, because if I'm not mistaken, she's the one who reached out to them when we were working on our article. She okay. evidently has some knowledge um, on how to do that. 
Yeah, I, I was never in touch with Brandon Berger Harris. I, I was right. never in touch with either of them. Uh, or Nicole may know. I'm sure Nicole knows. Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll I'll ask of her next week. Did when you talked to? I'm sure you did. Does, did Barbara Payton have a lot of living relatives that you were able to speak? Oh to yeah, you? in fact, I, yeah, her son um, actually worked with me on the book. I, at first, he didn't want any part of it because his mother, she's been so maligned over the years. You know, just so so maligned mm. and degraded in print. But once he saw what my intent was that I wanted to bring out her humanity and her many good qualities that, that won him over. And we wound up becoming wonderful friends and we are, we've stayed friends to this day. Oh, and in fact, he wrote, yeah, he wrote the foreword to the book. So, um, he's totally behind it. He supported it. He, he's happy with it. He said a lot of it brought, brought him a lot of pain reliving those times with her. But he's glad that I did it because I set the record straight, and he felt it needed to be set straight. Oh, it had to be cathartic for him. How how old was he when she passed? Um, well, actually, he was twenty. Let's see, twenty when she passed. But he she lost custody of him when he was ten years old, and not only did she lose custody of him, she never saw him again. They oh. kept him away. The family kept him away from his mother. Even though she wanted to see him, they wouldn't allow it. So she never saw him again. And that's when her downfall, her decline, really accelerated. Yeah, I would bet. To me, that's that's the cruelest punishment to do to a mother. Yeah. You know, to to keep her from knowing her son. It's heartbreaking. Mm. But her lifestyle was so bad by then, she couldn't help herself. She really couldn't. Yeah, and I mean, the, you know, the, the people she slept with is like a who's who of Hollywood. She's very promiscuous, very. But you know, you you hear about. I guess it's the nature of the creative community. There there are a lot of outside of the box personalities, a lot of very eccentric personalities, and they all gather yeah. in this one one community called Hollywood. So whenever yeah. whenever we hear like these these really horrible stories of. Of, of murder or scandal or any of that, it, it, it's, it seems to just all be a part of those people that don't fit in anywhere else. They converge yeah. in this one area. They're fringe <laughs> you know, like, characters. Yes. You know, to us, I mean, with our bourgeois sensibilities, we're shocked. But mm-hmm. it's, it's normal for them. That's the way life is. And they're on a totally different sphere, you know. They're, I think it's cool, actually, and I, I kind of understand the way they operate. Yeah. Um, but I'm fas- I'm fascinated by it. I really am. I, I am too. But but I mean that whole that whole culture and, and how the, how the Manson family story fits right into that the the outsiders that didn't fit in anywhere else and I mean that's a cautionary yeah. tale if if if, right. if you're of that ilk that don't feel like you fit in anywhere else I mean there's there's always false prophets out there that are trying to manipulate you but um, but then they yeah, latched on to Dennis Wilson who was a success mm-hmm. and you know it was two worlds two different worlds converging. You know, it's fascinating as hell. Yeah. So totally fascinating. I mean, I'm like you. I could eat up those stories, and I do eat them up. (laughs) (laughs) I I I honestly eat up those stories. I mean, I have 50 hours of, of, of Dateline mystery shows on my, on my TiVo. I'm, wow. I'm like obsessed with those mystery, you know, so I wanted to, but at the same time, I wanted to kind of try try my best to humanize each person that we're discussing on this series, too. I mean, uh, so yeah. that was my main yeah. objective. But, but I, I but, have uh, to be honest with you, modern Hollywood leaves me cold. Sure. Uh, you know, a lot of modern Hollywood leaves me cold because they're not living on the edge. How can they be living on the edge when everyone and their brother is behaving the same way? You know, it's not it's not cutting edge behavior. It's not it doesn't take guts to to be outrageous nowadays. Yeah. I mean, we were taught we talk about this a lot. I, I think, first of all, it's the it's the nature of that. We know everything about everyone now. <laughs> and and, yeah. and the yep. the whole nature of celebrity has changed. It used to be that you yeah. actually had to accomplish something to be a celebrity. Right. And right. then there there are no Robert Mitchums anymore. Like where's our Robert right. Mitchum? Genuine yeah. people, 
you know? Yeah, yeah. They were trying to say Colin Farrell was the new Robert Mitchum. I'm like, no, no, no. I like him fine, but Robert Mitchum does not exist. He's nowhere to be found. That's true. (laughs) Yeah, but you know yeah, what? You know true. what I think it is too. I think it's a change in the culture. I think you look around, and and men have become more. And I don't necessarily think this is a bad thing, but they've become more feminized in a yes. way. Yeah, uh, yeah. So I think Didn't it's Lauren, a cultural. I think thing. Lauren Bacall. Lauren Bacall even said something along those lines. She made a, a quote about that. Mm. And, uh, especially the leading today's leading men in Hollywood were were more feminized or are more feminized, you know. Yeah, and, I mean, you can't imagine Robert. Were. You can't imagine Robert Mitchum ever talking about his feelings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> so, Although yeah. they say he was a very nice man, you know, and I've mm-hmm. I've actually seen him speak very lovingly about Marilyn Monroe. I don't know if you've yes. seen an interview clip on YouTube. He speaks yes. very lovingly about her. So mm. he, yeah, he had a, a tender side, you know. Yeah. But he just didn't show it to everyone. 